I am the daughter of earth and water, and the nursling of the sky. I pass through the pores of the ocean and shores. I change, but I cannot die. For after the rain, when with never a stain, the pavilion of heaven is bare, and the winds and sunbeams with their convex gleams build up the blue dome of air. Come on, let's go. The clouds all have Latin names and uh, cumulus means a stack or a heap in Latin. They develop on top of thermals rising off the sun-warmed ground and thermals are just invisible columns of air which lift off the ground as it warms in the sun. I'm Gavin Pretor Pinney and I'm the founder and member number one of the Cloud Appreciation Society. I remember when I was maybe four or five, it was the first time I looked at a cloud, at least in any kind of conscious way. I looked at it and thought about it. I was being driven into school by my mum in uh, her little mini. She had a, a sky blue mini and uh, I remember going across London, going to school and seeing a cloud out the window that was, well it was basically the sun had a cloud in front of it and those beams of light that were splaying out from it. And so I you just noticed the cloud in the middle and it was looking so dark at the center and then bright around the edges as they do when they're lit from the other side. And I was curious about it and curious about what it was made of and why it stayed up there and um, what would it be like to sit on it. So uh, children, I think, at that, around that age do become interested in the clouds for the first time. It's when we perhaps forge our relationship with the sky around that age, out of curiosity. And then those questions, what's it made of, why does it stay up there, why does it look like that, those aren't answered when we become adults. They just, they just kind of don't get asked any longer. can think of the sky as sort of nature's art. It's why clouds in the sky have fascinated artists and poets throughout human creative output. The English painter John Constable was famously fascinated by clouds. In 1821, he began to make studies of clouds in an attempt to capture their transient energy. The challenge was so exciting to him that he would sometimes paint three or four a day out on Hampstead Heath, noting on the back of each one the time and the wind conditions. Constable referred to the time he spent painting the skies as skying, and his timeless pieces allow us all to appreciate the clouds and sky through his eyes. Some of Constable's paintings include little clues and reminders of the earth below, such as treetops and birds in flight. But Constable's focus was always on the sky, and more importantly, the cloud formations as they drifted over him. Mm -hmm. 
Many historians of art and science believe that Constable was influenced by his contemporary Luke Howard, who in 1802 presented his essay on the modification of clouds to the Eschesian society. My talk this evening is concerned with what may strike some as an uncharacteristically impractical subject. It is concerned with the modification of clouds. Having spent years monitoring the skies over London and sketching their changing shapes to record their patterns, he developed the first classification for cloud types that we still use today. Cirrus, cumulus, stratus. The romantic poets got into it and Shelley wrote a poem, The Cloud, that was really inspired by his different types. I bind the sun's throne with a burning zone and the moon's with a girdle of pearl. The volcanoes are dim and the stars reel and swim when the whirlwinds my banner unfurl. And I've come to realise over the years that reminding people of something that is so obvious that it's right there in front of them is actually a helpful service. Yeah, so a lot of what we're seeing today are just little cumulus clouds. So as the, the air heats up in the morning because it's quite cold above, you get these little bubbles of air rising up and these are the kind of tops of those bubbles. So the air gets there, the water in the air condenses and, and you see it form a cloud. So we get quite a lot of those today, partly because it's so cold. My name's Ed Grispit. I'm a research fellow in the Department of Physics and the Grantham Institute for Climate Change and Environment here at Imperial. Um, and yeah, my research topic is clouds, um, particularly how clouds are impacted or how their properties are changed by human activity. The drip evaporates, and then he's joined by his friends. They're together again. They float up high on the moist, warm air. We can't see them, but they're still there. They fly way up where the cold's intense, then back into droplets. They condense, and that's what makes a cloud. So each one of those droplets in these clouds is formed on a little aerosol particle. And they come from lots of different sources. So we can have aerosols from kind of natural sources. So sea salt is a big one. These kind of little droplets um, of water that get pulled off the ocean surface. When they evaporate, you're left behind with a little salt crystal. Um, so that's a big one in more remote regions. Um, desert dust is another big one. And then things like soot as well from human activity. Um, and if you have more of these aerosol particles through burning fossil fuels, for example, then you get more droplets in those clouds. Um, so a polluted cloud typically has more but smaller droplets than a clean cloud. So you can see these two jars here have about the same amount of, of plastic in, in this case, um, but the one on the left has lots of small droplets or lots of small beads. So that's like the polluted cloud, and the one on the right is like the clean cloud. And you can see that the one on the left is much more reflective. It looks whiter than the one on the right. Throughout nature, there is order. Weather is a constant blending of the basic elements, air, water, and sun. Clouds are um, condensed water, so either liquid or solid water. Uh, there's also plenty of water vapor in the air, but we cannot see it. So uh, the reason we see clouds is because it's not vapor, but it's either liquid droplets or ice crystals. And you have northwesterly winds, southerly winds, easterly and southeasterly winds like that. And that area of action is even greater than this. And more from, from childhood, I always watched weather bulletins and, and was always interested in what was going on. And that's, that then led to this interest in, in climate because weather and climate are just two sides of the same coin, really. So my name is Paolo Cepi and I'm a lecturer in climate science. I work in the physics department at Imperial College and also I'm affiliated with the Grantham Institute at Imperial. Clouds have a large impact on climate and even fairly subtle changes in cloudiness could have um, a measurable knock-on effect on global warming.
uh, in terms of future changes of clouds, um, that there will be less cloud cover, um, particularly over uh, tropical ocean regions. And these clouds activate like a sunscreen uh, because they're white and very reflective. So if you, if you lose those clouds, so you end up absorbing more sunlight and that warms the earth further. And that's one thing that most climate models simulate and that we found observational support for. So we find from observations that indeed that's likely to happen. There's one cloud formation that has changed over the last 100 years or so. This is the noctilucent cloud. Noctilucent means night shining. And it's really quite different from most of the clouds we're used to seeing because it's much, much higher in our atmosphere. They have a blue rippled appearance to them, perhaps with kind of ridges, and they might appear in maybe two, three hours after sunset. So when the sky is dark, these are shining. And the reason they're shining is because they're so high up that the sun still catches them, even though the rest of the sky below is dark uh, in the shadow of the earth. High clouds act a bit like a greenhouse. And, and so if the clouds rise, that amplifies again the warming. And these two separate effects, for different reasons, both amplify global warming. In the, in the kind of height of the Industrial Revolution in, in Britain, so the period from 1830 to 1880. So John Ruskin, an art critic and a keen amateur meteorologist as well, gave this lecture about um, the plague cloud and how um, he thought clouds had changed during the Industrial Revolution. Um, and he talks a bit about um, uh, these clouds where they used to be kind of bright, fluffy, they'd rain and then go, and even if there was a storm, it'd kind of rain, it'd go away and be nice again. These clouds in the Industrial Revolution kind of stuck around, they didn't rain, they were just grey and stood there for days. I mean, he was observing effects that were happening at the time he was alive. It's just we didn't know that that's how clouds might respond to pollution until a hundred years later. I bring fresh showers for the thirsting flowers from the seas and the streams. I bear light shade for the leaves when laid in their noonday dreams. From my wings are shaken the dews that waken, the sweet buds every one, when rocked to rest on their mother's breast as she dances about the sun.